Hey there, everyone. I'm joined here by Mark Cosiglo, who uh, is is doing some exciting new stuff um, and, and just uh, had an exit with Catalyst Software. Um, uh, Mark, it's uh, great to have you on uh, the podcast here. And um, today we're going to go through one of your LinkedIn posts. Um, for those who don't know who you are and, and don't have your background, I wonder if you could just give like a quick intro and then we'll jump right into the, the post itself. Yeah, yeah. So my name is Mark Cosiglo. I think most people know me from my time at Outreach. I was an employee one at Outreach and led sales to about $230 million as the global SVP or SVP of global sales. I can, I can never remember my title. I never asked for promotion once there. They just kept sending me up the ranks, which is nice. And then, uh, you know, after a good eight year run there, I went uh, to Catalyst as the CRO and and, and help them almost double their revenues in the 14 to 15 months that I was there. And then uh, they got acquired by Tatango and Tatango's uh, PE firm, uh, Great Hill Partners. And uh, that was a great time, mission accomplished for me. The founders brought me in to help them exit the business. And uh, so now I'm uh, working on some sit top secret projects, some of them uh, fun with my family, some of them business related, and hopefully to continue funding the fun of my family. <laughs> Nice, and I, I got your uh, outreach right in, or your your LinkedIn right in front of me. So your senior, your your final title was senior vice president of global sales. So there you go. Uh, there you go. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, let's jump into this LinkedIn post. I'm going to attempt to do a quick screen share here. Uh, let's see if I can find the right thing there. Yeah. Okay. So um, this post that you had about a week ago um, caught our attention and. Um, and it was, it's about uh, AIs, AI and SDRs and how, um, how that world is changing. I'm just gonna read the first part here and then we can uh, get into some questions. So it leads with how many companies are creating AI SDRs? Last count, 374. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very specific. It's crazy to read your own, <laughs> read your own stuff to you. Like, I, don't, <laughs> I hope people know uh, me well enough to know that's a complete BS number, but it might not be that far off. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask how you got to that number, but uh, now we know it's completely <laughs> it, fun. An advanced AI algorithm, Kevin, that looked at there many <laughs> different signals. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and, then, and then you go on to say you thought getting in touch with people was hard now. Imagine what happens when thousands of companies unleash AI SDRs. Here's what will happen. <laughs> so... Um, Fun, fun stuff here. So I, I uh, I'm gonna pause there before, and then you have like six different points, which we'll get into. Um, and yeah. it's really actually easy for me to follow along and, and have this as a format. So, but I, I want to stop there and just ask, what inspired this post? Like, what what uh, caused you to get up and you know crank this thing out? So I'm I'm working on a, a few things. I'm doing a little consulting. I'm doing a little fractional work. I'm you know working on a, a couple other projects and. Um, the amount of times somebody pings me about, what do you think of this company? And then I go look at it and it's AI SDRs. And what do you think about that company? And it's AI SDRs. And I just started to get tired of, and actually, you know, I started to make a bet. I bet you if I go here, I'm going to see AI SDR and, you know, nine times out of 10, that's what's happening. And so, so then the way my brain works is I start to think, okay, if everybody's kind of doing rushing to this AI SDR, what's the point? Well, the point is everybody wants to figure out how to do outbound at scale for very, very little cost and make it relevant enough that it works financially to deliver the results needed in your financial plan to hit your growth targets and do whatever that does for your company, right? Well, if everybody's trying to do that, what happens if everybody does it? Then inboxes are gonna be more packed. I mean, listen, I, I hate to say it, but when I started at Outreach, I had a nuclear weapon in my arsenal all of a sudden. And you know what? Did I pray and spray in the beginning? Hell yes, I did. And nobody could keep up with me. And we grew the company. I started as a 100% um, commission person. I sold a million bucks worth of outreach in like six months. And then we went from zero to two and a half our first year, two and a half to 10 the second year. And you know, a lot of that in the first year or so was spray and pray. After a while, the low hanging fruit went away. We had to get a lot more strategic and that's when we refined the product to make sure that pray and spray people we actually had this weird uh, customer in the beginning that we called Vlad the Destroyer. And all he would try to do was pray, like just spam the crap out of everybody using our system, which would 
cause us a lot of technical issues. So he helped us grow to get to scale, but like the way he was using the platform was not how it was intended or how we wanted it to be used. And so we eventually kicked them off and then we refined the platform to stop doing that. But like that outreach, sales off, all those companies all started to encourage a lot more volume. And then the volume, uh, you know, started to get to the point where the internet pushed back and started to create all of these barriers put in place to help the volume of email and reach out and outreach not get back, get not get into people's inboxes or our telephones because it was just overwhelming amount. And I think we kind of reached a, a nice balance with those tools where people understand I need to do a little more manual on all this kind of stuff. But AI like gets rid of that barrier. There's only so much work that a, a human SDR can do, even inside of a platform like that. Uh, even uh, even with the internet being bent against all of that, uh, those kind of tactics working, AI SDRs kind of get around all that. And so what's going to happen if you wake up in the morning and instead of, you know, 70 messages, you have 7,000 messages. I, that's a conceivable future. And that's just where my brain went. I'm a sci-fi nerd. So I take everything to the weird extreme with technology because uh, I've read <laughs> 400 books about it. And, what, and so like this is just me taking a thought to the extreme. Now I have to ask you what your what book you think will mirror reality. Uh, if you if anything comes to mind, what, which which is the closest book to what you think will uh, predict the future? I don't know if I have one of those, but I read a book called The Moat in God's Eye, written by Larry Niven, and it was the very first book that talked about an iPhone, and it was written in the early '70s. And the way he described it almost is exactly how it manifested itself in the real world. So it's really cool to kind of go back and read old sci-fi books and mm -hmm. see the parts of it that have come to actually be reality. Uh, the sci-fi books I, I read, uh, I think you know, there's some interesting things, biohacking and things like that, that I'm sure will end up, you know, making their way into the reality. But uh, it's better, it's more fun to look back at the old stuff and see what came, what actually came true, than it is to look, read the stuff now and figure out what will come true. Yeah, yeah. According to a lot of those things, I think flying cars were supposed to happen in 2000, early 2000s, and <laughs> that hasn't happened quite yet. So. <laughs> uh, well, let's get back to back to the post. Um, you kind of talked about this already, but let's let's touch on it a bit here. Where uh, the first point you have here is that email volume will become too disruptive. I'm not going to read it word for word, but uh, I think the the thesis is we already have a lot of email now with sequencers, um, and uh, thanks to you at Outreach, that, that's part of the the problem. Um, and then uh, you know, if AI writes good emails, like how will you process 500 of them? Uh, your point here is easy. You you won't uh, email equals useless. So in, in this new feature, um, you see email is completely going away or just um, being completely ineffective. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, l l let's get real here for Kevin. Do you know what percentage of people actually understand how to manage and process email? Less than one percent uh, is my guess. Nobody. Yeah, I, I've always. Uh, there is a person who I worked with at Segment, his name is Alan, and he was an email deliverability genius, but one out of every thousand employees can do that. And I've been in email jail and it's uh, just managing that whole process is, um, it's a, a, a diamond in the rough to find someone like that, yeah. That's for sure, but I'm even talking about like, how good is your mom at processing email? How good is your brother? How good is your next door neighbor? How good is your coworker? How good is your CEO? They all suck. You know how I know is when they open their phone and it says 23,715 unread. <laughs> and when I look at their no inbox, at inbox zero. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, well, listen, I'm an inbox zero guy. I understand how to process my email. I process it in real time daily all the time. I typically end the day with less than one or two messages in my email inbox. I, I, I've learned this skill 15, 16 years ago. And, uh, but I, like, I'm not a normal person. Most normal people use their email inbox like a to-do list. And it's the worst to-do list in the, in the world because it's crammed with a bunch of stuff that you actually don't want to do. And so you're kind of, people have these stars and this and the labels and all that kind of crap. Mm -hmm. And they use it for two weeks, like, you know, a new year's resolution. And then it just goes away because it's too unwieldy to manage. That's in the current situation. That's been the situation even before outreach and stuff increased email volumes. Before COVID increased email volume, it was still bad and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And that's what I'm saying is, is like, if people lack the skill to, to process email when it's on two 
and AI cranks it to 11, there's no way they're going to be able to process email. And the only thing you, you like right now, the way you process, most people process is they read it and they're like, okay, this one looks good and let me start or whatever. Okay, this one, let me pay attention to this one. And then they kind of like maybe have some folder system or whatever. They don't actually process the email. They just hope to remember it later. And so like that, that's the problem is, is pretty soon you won't be able to go through your inbox, I don't think, and look for relevant emails because there'll be just too many emails in there to even do that. And that like for someone like me, that that, state, no. yeah, when someone like me that knows how to process email, I'm like, what the heck am I going to do? Like I, I, I'm already kind of at my edge of how much time can I spend processing email in a day? I don't need to add two X to that. And so that's when I'm going to just be like, you know what? I'm out on email. And it's funny, Manny Medina, our CEO at, at Outreach, at one point he's like, like this, that's, he's like, that's it. I'm done with Slack. And his, he had an automated message. is like, do not Slack me. I will not answer. I hate Slack. And that, wow. you know, I think that that's what's going to happen is people are going to have auto responders on their email. That's like, email is useless. Don't email me. And if you don't have my cell phone number and can't text me, then I don't want to talk to you anyway. And that's, that's where we're going to, I think that, again, likelihood, I don't know, maybe semi-likely, uh, fun of doing it in a post and making people think about it. Like that's a hundred. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it kind of segues nicely into the next point you have where it, maybe maybe this will be the rescue of that where spam and regulatory agencies will intercede. And we've already seen Google do some of that, in, or I guess Yahoo too doing some of that. Um, and uh, let's see, you, you say um, in here that you know, able to look out for other emails and squash them. Fines will go up. Inbox filtering will go nuts. Um, it's time to relaunch Gated, which is a product that I uh, love that, that sunsetted. Um, so yeah, how do you, how do you see maybe spam and regulatory agencies coming to the, to the rescue or just blocking things that are um, uh, clearly spam and, and not what users want in their inbox. Yeah, so p the people that control these things, the reason that they control them is because they were pissed off by what was happening. And so they created an agency or joined an agency and then figured out a solution. And those people are gonna just get more and more incensed at what's happening. And so they're gonna create more and more barriers so that they can actually use the email channel, which is what they want to, they, that's how they wanna communicate. So they're gonna try to protect it. And so what that ends up meaning is, is like people that write AI emails and do AI automation, there will be AI products that are meant to squash the effectiveness of, of the AI. And that's where I make the funny thing, like World War III starts over uh, outbound AIs that are, one is trying to get, you know, the other one is trying to prevent. And the next thing you know, like they, they cause World War III, but like, the, how's that going to happen? You, you get through by building the best AI. Uh, you, like to me, like we're, we're entering it into a, a weird point of humanity. Like think about this. When I, when, if we were cavemen, Kevin, what was the only way that we couldn't communicate? Distance. Other than that, we could walk up to each other and grunt and draw a cave drawing and, you know, go kill a mammoth together if we decided we wanted to do that. Th then what happened is, is, okay, you know, things start to progress and now there's different languages and now you have to distance and language. And then the next thing happens is letters and things like that. Well, now I got to like know your address and then there's a phone. Now I got to know your phone number. And then, you know, now there's email. Now I got to know your email address. And then all of a sudden, all the, the do not call lists and the spam lists start to happen. And right. And so you can see like humanity, I think the one of the greatness is, great things about humanity is our ability to communicate with each other. But because of people abusing the freedom of communication, we start to erect barriers to communication and we lose part of our humanity when we do that. And you know, if 10% of your market is either in the um, consideration or decision phase of the buyer's journey, that means 90% of people are just kind of semi-aware or mostly unaware of the problem. That means that they have to figure out solutions on their own. And haven't all of us solved the problem that we didn't know existed by the person that sold us the thing to solve it? And it opened our mind to something and changed and enriched our life. And if that part of humanity goes away, then only, the only people that ever are going to give us new ideas are ourselves or the very small sphere of people that we allow into our communication channels. And to me, that, that creates a weird diversity and inclusion problem. And so like, I'm taking this to like really weird extremes, but like, I think that you need to consider those extremes in, in order to really understand like what you're about to do. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it, um, the next point you have is kind of alluding at that a little bit too, where 
uh, spiral back to ancient times as, as door-to-door B2B sellers start to take uh, Ubers uh, to random wealthy neighborhoods and knock on doors. It's like it's coming back to um, person-to-person exchange uh, is maybe like a fun uh, prediction or a, a um, if you're if you're taking this to the, the extreme extent, like where it might go to. So, um, yeah, uh, I think let's actually start with the beginning of this where other AI channels will get AI-itis. So email continues to erode. Uh, SDR companies will move to the phone and LinkedIn DMs. And I think LinkedIn will, camp, I, I'm sure my in, LinkedIn inbox is already super spammy. I'm sure you've seen that. And I can imagine that LinkedIn will crack down too. So um, what's left is, you know, person to person type of engagement, I think is what you're getting at here, but maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. Well, first of all, Kevin, I'm a somewhat offended. You didn't notice my strong emoji game on this point. Oh, sorry. Pretty, yes. Pretty fire. <laughs> all right. No, no. But uh, yeah, so l- listen. Robot with the sneeze. A- AI-itis, robot with the sneeze. I got to call it out. Yeah, strong emoji game. I, I uh, it, right? uh, got to recognize that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, we know what happens when technology becomes uh, too aggressive is there's a cohort of people that pull back from that technology and go back to more traditional, more human-based stuff. And I think that that's what's going to happen is, is the great sellers will realize that your AI SDR, your AI emails, your AI LinkedIn DMs, your AI phone calls aren't working. And the AI robot that visits the office isn't quite ready yet. So there's a little sliver there for me to differentiate, to take a new approach. And to me, I posted about this recently, is that there's only one, to me, real way to get consistently awesome results. And that's, you have to just be a very creative person. If you aren't creative, you're not going to figure it out and you're always gonna follow the herd and it might work for a while, but then you gotta follow a new herd when that herd jumps off the cliff right into the ocean. And so like you, this is what's happening here is people are gonna follow the AI SDR herd. People are gonna follow AI email herd. They're gonna follow the, whatever. I think a better solution is how do you figure out how to be creative so you can zig when other people zag? I read a book early in my sales career by Jeffrey Gittimer called The Little Red Book of Sales. It's a really cool book. It's a super simple read, uh, you know, not to be vulgar or anything, but it's the kind of book you put on your toilet and you can get something out of it. Like, you know, by the time you get back up. Right. And it's like nice little chapters, crazy fonts, crazy drawings, probably breaks a million rules of books. But the thing about that book is it says, be creative. That's like the, the two word TLDR, that book, be creative. Creativity matters. And I learned that really early in my sales career. And I've always tried to do things a little differently. And, you know, here's a good example of that is like, I was uh, working with a new leadership team. We did personality testing. And then they wanted to do a team building exercise where they put different personality types together and they gave them a common task. And your job was to observe how different personality types engage with this task. And the task was, Let's take a bag, a big bag of Skittles and make a, a drawing of a house. And so you can imagine I'm, I'm watching and everybody just starts to do the same thing. Here's the green grass. Here's the red roof. Here's the blue sky. Here's the yellow sun. And it looks like a first grader drew it. Well, immediately I said, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to make the best dumb idea. I want to have like, at least I'm, if I'm going to fail at this thing, I'm going to fail like doing something totally different. So what we did is we took all the blue um, Skittles and we made a blueprint and then we used all the color Skittles and we made the furniture and the layout. And of course, who won the exercise? We did because it was completely different. It wasn't better. It was just different. And so like, that's what I think is going to happen. And the different will be the rep that's willing to get on the, the plane, whose company will be able to foot that bill, who's not afraid to go door to door or whatever it is and figure out like, this is the new creative way to make things work. And, uh, you know, so th- that's what that's mo- more about than anything is, is like as AI starts to infiltrate more and more channels, the only real thing that's going to work is like the things that the AI can't do, which is like getting in front of people and just being like really, really creative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a core principle of marketing too, is, you know, zig or zig where other people are zagging or differentiate. I feel like with AI, uh, everyone's prospecting out of the same data set and, the personalization all ends up becoming the same. The message all becomes the same, and it's really going to be hard to stand out if everyone's got the same tool set. Is also inundating their prospects with the same kind of messaging. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like marketers ruin everything a lot of times, and that's probably one of the ways we'll we'll do it in the future. I'd imagine. Um, 
Cool, so let's go on to uh, point four, which is uh, blacklist black holes. So uh, I'll just read this one out. So your domains will become undeliverable. Your phone numbers are blocked. LinkedIn shuts down your account. You realize critical emails, contacts, and service requests are not sent. Your business is sucked into a black hole because all, you've all been blacklisted on all communication <laughs> channels. <laughs> this is my biggest fear as a marketer. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I want you to, to elaborate on this. I, I, I've been in, in Gmail and GL before and it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, well, we've seen, we've seen at Outreach so many of our customers call us and they're like, listen, our emails aren't getting out. And that's because we, we've figured out, well, that's because you're spamming and the spamming stuff has done what it's supposed to do and it's blacklisted your stuff. And they're like, well, listen, my contracts aren't going out for my reps. My my uh, Zendesk uh, tickets resolution emails aren't going out. Those are business critical things, but they got shut down because a couple reps decided that they wanted to put it on easy button and go work for three weeks in Costa Rica and put 10,000 people in the sequence in one day, right? And email them three times a day. Like, you know, that's the kind of stuff that like, the, those behaviors sound ridiculous, but I guarantee you, Kevin, that people are trying to figure out how to do that with AI and get away with it. And like, that's, yeah. that, that's to me where like, well, listen, as soon as, and to the next point, like, other AI and our previous point, other AI is going to start to look at it and be like, you are an AI spam bot. And guess what? We're going to shut your ass down. And that's where you're going to just get no, nothing is going to go out. Even the stuff that your CEO wrote to their mom from his business address is not going to go out because you acted in a way that you needed to be shut down. Uh on that topic, I, I feel like you're probably familiar with the space, but there's the, these companies that do the like domain warming and, and all of that management. Do so you think AI will also figure that out and, uh, and, and uh, put a squash on, on bad behavior there? Uh, I think there's some companies that are being really sneaky, like in a good way about how they're doing it. I think, like I did a post maybe two years ago where I called those people cheaters and they were ruining the world for the rest of us and poisoning the well. I, I've come around in my thinking there. I think it, you have to do it now. Like I don't like it, but it's a, it's a necessity. So I think that eventually AI will figure out, well, let me send an email to that address. Let me do this, let me do that. And I'll determine if this is like a real person or not. And if this is an address that's actually being monitored and all that kind of business or, you know, there's, I'm sure there's patterns of behavior that these warm up companies are doing on a domain that has some kind of signals that an AI could see that that's happening. I, mm -hmm. I, I think it'll, I think that they'll probably get figured out, but like, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, this uh, next point we're at point five now is that, uh, is one that actually, I don't think it's discussed all that much, but AI buyers will emerge. Uh, let me just read this first part here. So actual humans will leave commercialized communication channels and a new wave of AIs will take over handling email, phone, and social. So you thought old school gatekeepers were tough. AI, AI gatekeepers don't build relationships. They create them to be used to accomplish their di directives. Uh, and then you have <laughs> an AI back and forth here, <laughs> which is fun. I love this post, man. I'm falling in love with this post. I did a good job on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's, um, it's very entertaining to me. Uh, and that's mostly what I hope for is this semi-entertaining post where you learn a little bit along the way. And at least makes you think, right? But yeah, like this yeah. is, yeah. is going to happen. You're crazy if you don't think it's going to happen. Like, why would it happen? I actually have a couple ideas. And fun, oddly enough, this post probably generated 50 DMs, emails, and texts about people wanting me to help them figure out how to have a company or a product to do this. So I'm sure I'm not the first person to think about it, but the idea resonated enough for that many people to reach out to me and, huh. and want to pick my brain about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting concept where you're just like, you're, you're a buyer, you set AI to go do the research and all that stuff for you. And then as a seller, there's like maybe some marketplace to match the two and then the AIs battle it out together. And then, you know, there's no human in the mix to have to, you know, go through procurements and decision-making and all that stuff. Um, it's, it, it could be a lucrative and interesting space. I can totally see that being a market, but I haven't heard of anything as of yet. So. I was just, oddly enough, like you think about it, maybe the next generation of salespeople are prompt engineers that can create prompts and AI things that allow one AI to win, quote unquote, over another AI. I could also see 
I was at a cur- uh, recently at an investor dinner with a bunch of founders that were highly intelligent. And there was one guy that was like, listen, the new behavior now is don't go to Google and Google it, but like ask AI because you can get all this other stuff. And he's like, just like uh, SEO became a thing, AIEO, and we started calling it EIEIO, right? <laughs> uh, and But AIEO will be how do I gamify lay large uh, LLMs, large language models, how do I, how do I take care of AI in a way that it recommends my product for me because I have figured out how to infiltrate how it works. And if you don't think that's happening, you're crazy too. Cause people are starting to ask AI, Hey, what software should I buy? Give me a comparison. What are the pro- positives and negatives? And if somebody gets in there and does something to that AI and steers the AI into your direction, they have a competitive advantage. And I think that there's a lot of companies right now thinking about how to do that. You know, I, this, this conversation scared me a little bit and I'm feeling like by the time this happens, I want to be retired. (laughs) 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 It's very interesting thought process or or a thought exercise. Uh, okay, so let's get on to the very last point here, point six, uh, AI, uh, and AI will develop a new way of communicating (laughs) Uh, so let, let, let me read this part here too. So telepathy uh, from surgically implanted technology like Elon is creating starts. Uh, of course, it quickly becomes necess- necess- a necessity to navigate the world so it's free and ad supported. Uh, so uh, <laughs> share a little bit more about this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cracking myself up here. Sorry, that this is this is funny. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> so listen, like. Um, the, I was working at outreach with some extremely intelligent data scientists and AI people, like the best of the best. And that they got me to understand that AI is, you, you can't think of it like our human brains. It's, it's so much more capable. It's so much less biased. It can take in, it doesn't forget anything. It can take in millions and millions of signals and process them in near real time. And human brains just they, they do a version of that, but not uh, like, you know, right now, w- you know, your brain is filtering out 10,000 other stimulus that aren't re- required for the tasks that we're doing. And so, but AI can do that in like any kind of arena, right? And so what they stressed to me is like, Mark, what will happen is eventually AI will start making recommendations that seem nonsensical to humans. And humans are either going to have to trust it and go with it, or they will buck it and they will diverge from the AI positive people, the AI centric people. And they'll become kind of two camps. There'll be the camps that's like, listen, um, AI, I don't understand it, but it helps me and I can see it in the results. The other people are like, I won't use something I can't understand. And so that's what's going to happen, I believe, is that as these channels exhaust, and they become, you know, the black holes, the spam filters, the ignoring, all that happens. AI is going to start to spin up and think, what is a different way for me to communicate with people to still accomplish my directives? And I think that, you know, an, an outcome of that could be some new way of communicating that humans don't th- haven't thought of or can't think of. And that way will, I think, start to... Uh, uh, increase because it'll be the new way. It won't be spammed. It won't be games. Maybe AI will figure out a way to prevent that from happening. But yeah, I, I could easily see AI as a solving the problem of, hey, I need to be an a- AI SDR and book meetings and none of these communication channels work. Well, I'm going to just go out and figure out a new way to communicate with people. And then, I mean, I could see that happening. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, it's already, it's, we've seen it happen in our lifetime where people communicate via emojis, people communicate in all sorts of different um, uh, formats. And I can see AI totally running with that and and, uh, making it into a format that is even more quickly digestible by our small brains uh, compared to AI. So yeah. Um, uh, Well, I uh, really enjoyed the post. Uh, I enjoyed that you rereading it with you to to give you this and you got such a kick out of it. I wonder if there's anything else, uh, any other, uh, any any comments in here that stood out to you or anything like that that you remember. I know it was a week ago, so it's uh, uh, maybe not top of mind exactly, but um, maybe we can, can close with that or close with, um, you know, uh, uh, closing thoughts on your end. Yeah, I think like, um, so 
sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling a little spicy or a little funny or just, you know, what is, what is an extreme line of thought that I can follow? And this is an example of that. Like th this is just me taking a simple thought of there's a lot of AI SDR companies. What happens if this really works? Like what, if I let my brain wander, where does it end up? And this is that, that that's in my, tw I spend about 20 minutes a day doing my post. This is what I came up with in about 20 minutes. Right. And so I, I, I still think though, that ultimately there's only one tree, true differentiator, one true thing that you can always count on to work. And, and that is what we mentioned earlier, which is creativity. And I think that what will happen is, is creative people will become more and more valuable. They'll become maybe more, not more rare isn't the right term, but like you'll have to really, um, you know, elevate yourself to be considered into this class of creative people. And I see this class of creative people right now in Outbound and they're called growth hackers. And they can take that list that you have, Kevin, and you're good and you can help your outbound team and not a prospect and you get X results. Well, this sales hacker is just more creative than you. They think about this one thing 10 times as much as you think about it and all of the other responsibilities you have. And so guess what? They come up with more creative stuff and they get 10X the results you can on the same exact list. And how are they doing that? It's not because they have warmed up email things is because they're more creative. And so like, that's where I think that we're headed is we're, we're headed to a place where the only thing that's not a commodity is creativity. And so how do you flex and build that creative muscle so that you aren't somebody that's just sitting there, like, you know, messing with the AI, uh, and you're instead like the person that's trying to figure out like, right. You're the, instead the person that is zigging while everybody else is zagging and benefiting from that uniqueness. Yeah. I love that closing thought and uh, also really love the post. It was really fun going through it with you, Mark. Uh, everyone can follow Mark on LinkedIn and then stay tuned for what's coming next. So thanks so much, Mark. And uh, we'll sign off from here. Thanks, man.